Few men have the courage to pit themselves against the unknown. And even fewer are prepared to face it alone. Especially if it involves a single-handed exploration of the wilderness. These men stand apart from their fellows. An air of mystery surrounds them. They're solitary men. Loners. Alagus Trahanus was such a man. Fourteen summers before, Alagus had been the first man to navigate the entire length of the Gordon, the wildest river in the country. But on this January day, it was to be different. The man who had devoted half a lifetime to photographing and showing people the wild beauty of southwest Tasmania, who had fought to preserve Lake Pedder and save the last stand of hewn pine from extinction, was to be taken by the swirling waters of the Gordon. He was the kind of man that seemed to me to have absolutely illimitable depth. Uh, you meet some people and you peel off a layer and you peeled off the layer and there's nothing much there. You kept on peeling off layers with the Lagos and again and again you find there's more and more to discover. It's the kind of man that you feel he's been on earth before, so wise that you felt that he couldn't know all that he did know in one lifetime without having some sort of a shot before. Now, I, I know this borders on uh, reincarnation, but there was an inner certainty about a Lagos that I've not seen in many people. Alagus was born in Lithuania. As a boy, he was a loner, spending much of his time hiking in the mountains that surrounded his home in the small town of Cholet. This self-reliance was tested during the war when he fought with the Lithuanian resistance against the Germans. Those hard, dangerous years taught him how to live off the land with little help or support. When the war ended, he was angered to see his country handed over to the Russians. He escaped to Bavaria, and three years later, arrived here in Tasmania. His influence fell like a spell on many people. Max Angus was one of them. On the day of the funeral, I suddenly thought, we can't just let this go by without a record. And all the material in Alagus's life led to thinking about a book, his marvellous photographs, his exploits. So I simply said to my friends outside the church, look, I'm going to do a book on Alagus. And one or two of them looked at me and said, if you want any help, count me in. The committee was formed that night. Minutes of the 74th meeting of the Alagus Trahanas Publication Committee. President, the Chairman, Max Angus. They gathered here every Sunday for the next three years to work on the book. Experts had advised them to leave Alagus's name off the cover because no one could pronounce it and to get a cheap book out quickly, otherwise people would forget him. But the amateurs took their time and when they finally produced the book, they put a $20 price tag on it. The first edition of 5,000 copies sold out in three weeks. The second in six months. They are now working on the third edition. Their memoir to Alagus Trahanus has become a bestseller. You've been working on this book for five years now. Why have you done it? I suppose because I was a friend of Alagus's. Possibly my best friend. Elspeth? I knew Alagus almost from the moment he came to Tasmania and we knew what he was trying to do in all his trips 
and we sincerely wanted to carry this on. And when you decide to do something, following a Lagos, you've got to do it as well as you can. And this means we all had to give it everything we've got. Max? Yes, there's a lot in that. Also, I think that a Lagos made us so embarrassed about what we were doing to our own place in Tasmania when he came from Lithuania and made us feel a lot of heels for the way we were treating the place, chucking beer cans everywhere, where he said, you don't love your country if you throw beer cans everywhere. Peter, why did you give all this time? Well, Halagos was a, a particular friend of mine, and uh, I think he was a man that literally became a legend in his own time, both through his photography and uh, his exploits. And uh, I think it's, it's really no surprise that the book sold as well as it did. As a migrant, Alagus was obliged to work for two years in a job of the government's choosing. For Alagus, they chose a menial labouring task at the Electrolytic Zinc Works near Hobart. It was anathema to Alagus, but he worked hard and was to say at the end of his time that he was the best pusher in Tasmania. To escape the grinding monotony of the zinc works, he did what he loved best. So began the long treks and the lone journeys into one of the last wilderness areas of the world, the unknown southwest corner of Tasmania. He was surprised to find that few people had been there. Every inch of Europe, he told his friends, has been trodden by some man at some time. But here, I might find places no one has seen. Alagus would disappear for weeks in this region of 5,000 square miles. An area with no roads and no houses. A region exactly as nature formed it. In the southwest, Alagus found the home he was looking for and set out to explore it. His first major expedition had a characteristic beginning. He simply asked a friend which was the highest mountain in Tasmania and then set off to climb it. Federation Peak has a fearsome reputation where the weather is violent and the approach is unbelievably tangled and dense. Three years before, it took a party of six armed with ropes and pitons to reach the summit. Alagus climbed it alone. Alagus and I, I think, had a special relationship for some years in that uh, when I met him he didn't have a son and I was an only child and uh, I think the relationship developed uh, to a certain extent to one of father-son. I first met Alagus uh, when I was 17 at a National Fitness Adventure Camp at Dover. Uh, he was the sort of man who was very appealing to young boys. He had, he had the sort of interests and qualities which made him um, of particular interest in that uh, he was an adventurer. He, uh, he was a canoeist, a walker, uh, a climber, a sailor. He did all sorts of things that uh, boys are interested in, and that made him extremely appealing. His trip down the Gordon set the seal on his reputation as an explorer. The Gordon is the wildest river in Tasmania. It had kept its secrets well, 
nobody had travelled its length before. There were stories about the ferocity of the rapids, the steepness of the terrain, and that the river disappeared underground. Alagas set out to be the first man to journey down the whole length of the Gordon. He designed and built an expedition canoe especially for the attempt, which could be dismantled and carried around the difficult rapids and waterfalls he expected to encounter. His first attempt failed when he was swept over a 20-foot waterfall and lost his canoe and most of his equipment. Three years later, he tried again and finally got through to the Gordon Splits, a jagged and rocky gorge 100 feet high where the river was thought to run underground. As he travelled, he discovered major errors in the maps of the day and rectified them. He confirmed observations and brought back accurate information about places long shrouded in mystery. When Alagas finally arrived at the placid waters of Macquarie Harbour, the locals found it hard to believe that he had done what he had said he had, because no one had ever come that way before. He left his canoe at the jetty and telephoned his wife Melva in Hobart. Alagas Trahanus, post-war migrant, had navigated the Gordon alone, a feat never before accomplished in all the years of European settlement. Alagas was a superb bushman, as he demonstrated on some of his trips through the wilderness. But more than that, he was a man who was open to the feeling of nature. He could feel its moods, um, appreciate its subtle changes, and gain pleasure from even the smallest things in the bush. He thought deeply about the value of wilderness to man. Alagas was moved by the timelessness of this land. He realised that once it was destroyed, it could never be replaced. It is a wild land. Um, and I think that there's a certain wildness, a certain uh, wild element in, in man's nature which is essential to the, to the humanness of man. If man becomes too tamed, uh, too docile, programmed, uh, then he becomes less human. And uh, this wildness in the wilderness um, allows the wildness in man uh, an expression. The wilderness experience depends on the on the particular person. For some people, it may the wilderness may be experienced in terms of a of a physical thing like a, a gymnasium. Um, for them, it's important to get from A to B in a certain time. Uh, and at the other extreme, uh, you have the person who to whom the wilderness is something akin to a cathedral. Uh, he feels close to nature. He feels that he knows himself better and uh, also he knows he comes closer to the life force or, or God or, or whatever. And that's the wonderful thing about wilderness, that uh, it has so many different facets. basic, very practical reason that uh, Alagas photographed uh, was to show other people uh, what he had seen, to uh, show them how beautiful Tasmania was. Um, and I don't think anyone else has seen Tasmania's landscape 
uh, with Alangus's eyes. And I don't think that anyone else has seen as much of wild Tasmania as Alangus did. There is a magic ingredient in any great artist's work and there is in Alagas' photography. You could pick one of his photographs at the other end of a salon where a group of photographs were showing. One little thing that he said that I think has a clue, or gives a clue, to the quality of his mind when he said, or wrote down on a little note that we found in his papers after he died, why is it that at photographic exhibitions one sees so many clever prints and so few moving His prints have the power to move in a way that you can't. I've seen people pick up this book, never heard of him, uh, and look at one or two photographs and say, I've got to have this. It's the quality, the, that hidden radium quality, that other dimension that's in, in a Rembrandt or any great artist of any kind that's in a Lagos's work. I can't explain it. Nobody can, but we all know what it's about. The forces of nature, which Alagus had captured so well in his photographs, were to tragically destroy all of his work. The great fire which swept through southeast Tasmania in 1967 destroyed 1,500 houses. One of them was the home Alagus had built for himself and his family. Along with his home, he lost his unique collection of 17,000 slides and photographs of the Southwest. At the time, he was to say to his friend Max Angus, I can rebuild my house, but I can't replace my slides. I feel my whole life's work has been in vain. The same year, the Premier announced the decision to flood Lake Pedder and put it under 50 feet of water as part of a giant hydroelectricity scheme. Alagas was torn by divided loyalties. He was at the forefront of the fight to save Pedder, and yet he was an assistant engineer with the Hydroelectricity Commission. This dismayed him, and he found himself in the position where he was working for an organisation which was about to destroy the place that he loved. And he was not allowed as a public servant to speak about this or to criticise. So that the shape of things to come really has all the characteristics and form of a Greek legend. He found himself wanting to do something and being constrained by his employer and not able to speak. Therefore, all that he could do through the great art of his photography was to show people what they were about to lose. He went out to re-photograph the lake to show people what they would be losing. Because like so much of the Southwest, few people had seen it. He spent 30 days at a time photographing Petter, using up his long service leave and what spare cash he had to prepare a slide presentation. Lake Petter, to those who knew it, was the most beautiful feature of the southwest. It lay in the heart of the wilderness region, an expanse of pure fresh water and white quartz sand. 
Thousands of Tasmanians crowded to see this eloquent defence of the lake and country around it. But as Alagus later acknowledged, the fight to save Petter had started too late. He said to me once, the clock has been wound and Petter will go. We must continue to fight for it. But the real fight should now be on for the Gordon and the Pyman because they are next in line. The future of the Gordon River and the forests upstream weighed heavily with the Lagos. If the Gordon was dammed, the water held back would give easy access to the last great stand of hewn pine trees in the world. He feared the timbermen would cut down in a few months trees which had taken 1,000 years to mature, and he was determined to prevent it. So he spent a great deal of time and energy and succeeded in having this, uh, this hue and pine forest declared a reserve. And the story behind that and the difficulties he had with officialdom in forestry and the government and so forth, uh, and his work with the, uh, the Australian Conservation Foundation were an absolute lesson in what the administration of conservation is all about. And of course now the reserve is called after him. It's officially gazetted as the Trahanus Hue and Pine Reserve. For Alagus, the Hue and Pine Reserve was a great triumph, but it left him drained, more than he knew himself. I remember taking this photograph the night before our last yeah. camp at Peter finished, and he was standing on the sand dunes photographing the sunset, and I was down below, and I faced my long lens up to him and just snapped him, and, and uh, when I printed that, I was quite shocked. In fact, I hadn't realised how much older he'd got in that last year or two, and I think it really did take it out of him. This part-time conservationist was pushing himself to the limit, but there was one more battle left for him to fight, one more journey to be made. The Gordon Splits was threatened by another dam, and Alagus went back to photograph them. He said so many things that became significant afterwards, but over and over again he expressed concern about the trip that he had to make down the Gordon, and he said that he was older than he was, so much older than when he did it the first time, and it was going to be very, very difficult. Um, but he'd, again, with that trip, planned everything absolutely carefully. When they set off on that particular day, I did become concerned, and I, they, they went, and there was a strangeness about their going. Melva Trahanas had seen her husband set out on similar expeditions, but she felt uneasy about this one. I went to visit his mother. She was a, a very fine old lady with a little of the mystical content of people from the land, and uh, I could see that she was really concerned, and we spent the rest of the afternoon um, talking about Olegas and his boyhood. And during our conversation, um, we both sort of were avoiding somehow um, the problems of the trip. And I knew it and she knew it. And that was very unsettling. And uh, later I realised that was about the same time that um, the accident had occurred. Two policemen came to see me that night and uh, cautioned me that there had been an accident and that they were uh, concerned that the legs hadn't been found. At that time, I immediately contacted uh, one of the legs' friends who's very concerned with the search and rescue area, and he's a very competent mountaineer, and he uh, he immediately called up a group of his climbing friends and they set off immediately to go into the area because our concern was that Olegas had been swept downstream and could, be, um, could have been flung against rocks and was unconscious on the banks of the river. There were quite a number of people there searching and uh, I set off 
with several of my friends downstream uh, to see what we could do. Um, at that stage, it looked as though the situation was fairly serious because uh, the canoe had been found. It was very badly damaged. It had obviously been under tremendous pressure in the water. The canvas was cut uh, along the stringers to the extent of several feet. So we made our way downstream as far as possible, uh, several miles, without finding any trace. Uh, we came back. I was close upstream uh, in a particularly, from the canoeist's point of view, dangerous uh, area because uh, there was a log in the water. And uh, quite often where you have a log, you have the water not only going over, but going under. So that uh, if something is traveling downstream, uh, particularly underwater, then it will get caught on the log and the pressure of water will hold it there. The decision was made to dam the river using a bulldozer, uh, using the, the rock and rubble that was at the base of the, uh, of the construction works. This was done, the water level gradually dropped and uh, the searches spread out along the river at various points. As the water level dropped, I stayed at that particular spot. And uh, as it dropped even further, I looked down and uh, I saw a sand shoe waving backwards and forwards in the water. And uh, a lagus was there, caught on the log. There were many people there, many. Uh, there were police, uh, skin divers, bushwalkers, uh, numerous people. I turned and, and walked away after the others knew where I was. things that are really important to me, I think, now. And my friendship with the Lagos was about the most important thing that happened to me. Because it's a difficult thing to say, but it's the spirit of a Lagos and his attitude towards the world that endures in me. I believed him. I still do. 